Hey, hey, welcome everyone uh, to another Boston Closure Group virtual meetup. Uh, we're happy to have another interesting talk lined up for you this, this evening. Um, so tonight's presentation is titled Closure Transducers, Sequence Processing on Stero Stero <clears throat> Steroids uh, by Mayank Prakash. Um, Mike is an application architect and a software veteran of more than 40 years. Uh, he first tried Lisp out uh, back in the 80s, and he was excited by its power and flexibility. He's tried lots of uh, various Lisp dialects, but recently he's discovered Clojure, and uh, that's become his first choice for functional programming as it is for, for many of us. Uh, so with that, let's get started with the presentation. Everyone, please welcome uh, Mayak, Mayank Prakash. And thank you, Mark, uh, for this nice introduction. Uh, and can you see my screen? We can see it. Yeah. Okay, great. So my talk today is on closure transducers. Uh, this is something which uh, is not very well documented in the closure documentation itself. And I had to dig around to get the real scoop on it. So I thought it would be a good idea to actually give a proper introduction and uh, uh, encourage more people to understand what they are and how to use them. And it's actually a very brilliant idea and uh, it's a really powerful idea. So I think it's uh, something very useful as well. Um, so here's the outline of the presentation. First, I will describe what problem uh, transducers actually solve. And followed by you know, take a step-by-step -step approach to get towards the final solution, how we actually get why, why the transducers are done the way they are done. And finally, we will see how Clojure actually has a lot of built-in functionality, which makes use of transducers easy. Uh, some technical points, if you want to implement your own transducers, although most of the time that is not necessary, and a partial list of references at the end. So transducers, so what is uh, the problem here? Uh, so like in most functional languages, uh, Clojure has a rich library of higher order functions uh, to do sequence processing, map, filter, take, take while, drop, partition, and so on, right? So there's a whole bunch of them. And all of them uh, go through a sequence step by step and do something uh, uh, with the elements of the sequence. Now, this is in contrast to imperative languages where you have to set up the loop first and define the loop variables and then write code which builds the output. Uh, so when you use a functional language uh, um, like the closure, all of those things are uh, hidden from you, you basically just need to say, okay, this is what I need to run, to be done to my sequence elements. And that simplifies things a lot, right? So it's a much higher level way of processing sequences. And unfortunately, there are some problems with the way these functions are defined. So the first problem is that, like if you take map, it has to understand how to traverse the sequence uh, so for each type, each new type of sequential source, you need to create map or each of these sequence functions again, right? So if I'm processing a in-memory collection or I want to process an event stream or uh, uh, like uh, core async uh, channels, uh, consumption, consumed core async channels, each of them has different way of doing it. And so you need to have copies of these functions for each of these inputs. 
And similarly, for each of the type of source and the target that you want, I want to output a vector or a list, or I want to write it to a queue, you need to have separate functions which know how to do it, uh, and, uh, the output the right thing as well. So the, that creates a very uh, complex, uh, there's a combinatorial explosion of the functions that you need to create. And that was largely the impetus for developing the uh, transducer framework in closure. Uh, most of the functions that I've described so far work with in-memory data structures, uh, which implement a seq interface and only generate lists as output. So if you want to do anything else, then we need to define new functions. And the other, another problem is that if I want to have, uh, run a sequence of operations, then each operation generates an intermediate sequence, which is passed to the next step. And that intermediate sequence will then be discarded. So there's a lot of unnecessary intermediate sequences which get generated uh, and which are not necessary. So for example, uh, so here's a simple example. I can take uh, a range of integer, list of integers, range uh, 10 gives me integers zero to nine and map will apply ink to each of the elements and give me the new sequence which goes from one through 10. Similarly, filter will take uh, this list of integers uh, and in, in this case, it will apply the predicate odd and filter out uh, the even numbers from there only returning the odd numbers. Similarly, take will take the first five elements, uh, right? But if I wanted to now combine these things together, uh, the typical uh, approach that most closure programmers would use is to use a thread last macro, right? So we take the thread last macro, we give it the range as the first argument, uh, then the filter odd, and the thread last macro, if you don't know how it works, it basically takes the first guy here, pushes it in as the last argument to this function call, and then calls basically calls this uh, as filter odd range 1000 takes the result of that and pushes it as the last argument to the next function call. So it says map ink and the result of the or the this sequence and so on. Now the problem here is that the range 1000 will generate the sequence of numbers, which is passes to filter. Filter will generate a new sequence, which it then passes to map. Map will generate yet another sequence, which it passes to take. And take will only take these um, many elements that it needs, and the rest of these have to be discarded. So a lot of unnecessary work which is happening here. Now this is actually not as strictly speaking not very accurate because all of these functions are lazy, so they don't actually process the uh, all of the elements. They only do as much as is needed, uh, modulo thirty two, but. Still, if there, if there is, uh, if the take was like take 500, then you would still need to process 500 uh, element intermediate sequences, right? And so that would still generate num a large number of transient sequences. And if this, this sequence input was a large sequence, you can imagine how that would uh, you know, create a lot of unnecessary uh, memory uh, consumption, which is not really needed. Any questions so far? Am I being clear too fast, too slow? Okay. Shall we continue? Yes, please. Okay. So just to recap, if I want to read from queues uh, or reactive observables or write to those things, we need to create separate versions of all of these functions, which is really a pain, right? So that's... Uh, that's the basic fundamental problem that the uh, transducers were uh, created to solve. Like we don't want to do this all over and over again. So the main problem here is uh, the following. So we do need to have a different code to read and write from different types of sources. That is not the issue, right? The issue is that the standard sequence functions are con con conflating number of different concerns into one. Consuming the sequence, applying a transformation to the sequence elements, and producing the output. This is all being done in one blob. And what we want to do is to separate these concerns so that we can mix and match them at will. So we can read from any source, apply the transformations, and write to any source. 
and without having to rewrite uh, uh, the transformations themselves, right? So that is what uh, the ultimate goal of transducers is. So how do we do that? Now, the first thing to realize is that of all the sequence uh, functions that we have, uh, we have the master, the dead granddaddy of them all called reduce, right? And the reduce is basically a very generic function uh, which can be used to implement pretty much any other sequence processing function by passing it the appropriate uh, higher order function, right? So the reduce, here's the definition of map in terms of reduce. So the, the reduce takes a function of two arguments. One is the result computed so far and the next element of the sequence. And it produces, this function does whatever it needs to do to produce the next step of the result. And the reduce keeps repeating it over and over all the elements of the sequence till we build the final result. And that's what it returns. So in this case, in the case of map, this function takes applies the given function to the next element, conjo conjoins it with the sequence that we have built so far and returns that as the next sequence. And the next element is then conjoined to that one and so on and so forth. By the time we are done, we get the full uh, sequence with the function applied to each element. Similarly, the filter can be done in using reduce by passing it this function which applies the predicate to each element. And if the predicate returns true, it conjoins that element to result. Otherwise it just returns the result itself. And in both cases, we are passing the empty uh, list, uh, empty sequence as a uh, starting value for the result. And then the basically they will build up the sequence in this way. So what, why, why is this important or useful is because the reduce now takes on the responsibility of traversing the sequence. We, we take that responsibility out of this function. So the map, previously map was going, doing both of these things, filter was doing both of these things, but with reduce, we can now remove that part of it. So we at least have separated one concern, right? So reduce goes through the sequence and this function in orange is the piece which we need to supply in order to do what we want it to do, right? So the, the common pieces here are shown in blue. So the reduce, uh, this piece is the same in both cases and all, all the functions that we uh, can build uh, using reduce will have the same structure. But this orange function is the piece, piece where we need to supply in order to get uh, our processing done. So uh, the functions which can be passed to reduce are called reducing functions, right? So reducing function is one which takes two parameters, the result so far and the next element, and it returns the next stage of the result. And so the reduce will repeatedly apply that same function to the result so far and the next element, and that incrementally builds the result in this way. So the Functions here in the orange are reducing functions. Uh, and that, right? All standard sequence functions can be implemented using reduce by passing a suitable reducing function. We just need to uh, craft the proper reducing function and the reduce will take care of traversing the sequence. There is a small wrinkle there, but I will uh, come to that later. But basically that is the general idea here. So essentially, like for the, we, if we want to apply ink to a list of integers, then we pass this uh, reducing function. And similarly, if we want to filter out the odd elements, then we would pass this as a reducing function. And all the other sequence processing functions can be implemented by passing the appropriate, appropriate reducing function. So that's our step number one. So what we have done is we have to, we have separated out one concern, which is consuming the input sequence. Now, if we wanted to consume different types of sequence, we only need to create a new function, which looks like reduce, but knows how to consume something else. But we still are 
conflating the processing of each element and production of the output. Those are still done in the reducing function, right? And we are still generating intermediate sequences. So we have not gotten rid of that either. So let's go back to our reducing functions and see what's actually happening here. So if you see the actual building of the result is done by the conjoint function, which is buried deep inside the reducing function. So how do we get rid of it? How do we make it general? Well, so this is again closure. So we use higher order functions to extract it, this out and uh, pass it in rather than hardwire it in the function itself. So, excuse me. So the map which uses ink as the uh, function would be generated uh, by a function which looks like this. We have a higher order function which takes a builder function as an argument and it returns a reducing function which uses that builder to build the result. Similarly, the uh, filter odd will take the builder function as the argument and it will return a reducing function which uses the builder to build the result. <clears throat> so this allows us to extract uh, the, the basic output builder and uh, extract it out, right? So this, this is a key point. So I just wanted to make sure that we understand this. So we have a higher level function which takes the builder and returns a reducing function using that builder rather than build, having the con conjoin hardware into here. So now we can replace that conjoin with whatever we want to do. Uh, so this, you may have noticed that I'm hardwiring ink here, which is not really what you want to do. So we will actually get rid of that also in a bit. But this is the important point here is that we can pass the builder as the argument and we can generalize it that way. Makes sense? Okay. So what does the builder function do? It takes the results so far and the next element and returns the next stage of the result. All right. So builder takes whatever the result is so far and whatever is the next element process, next element, and returns there is new value of this result. So that can be applied to the next, uh, next element, right? So that's something that we know, we have seen that before, that's the reducing function. That's exactly a definition of a reducing function that takes the result so far and the next element and returns the next stage. So the idea here is that we can pass any reducing function as the builder and get a new reducing function back, which wraps the old reducing function in. And this is something which is an important concept and it's, that's what called a transducer. So essentially transducer takes a reducing function as a parameter. It returns a new reducing function which wraps the original reducing function. And this is really a powerful idea and we will see why that is a powerful idea. But I think the, the key thing here is that uh, that's what that's what it's a reducing function, reducing function mapping. Okay. So what we have done so far, we take the task of consuming input source and uh, pass it on to reduce. We take the task of generating the output and that is passed on to a builder function, which is a reducing function as well. The transducer takes the builder function and returns the new reducing function, which can now be passed to reduce. So this way we can consume and produce any types of sequence. Now we have basically, we have separated out the transformation from the consuming of the input and building of the output. So that's uh, really a key uh, concept and we will see examples of how that works, but this is uh, the key idea. Uh, Makes sense so far? Any questions? Okay. Either everybody is asleep or... I'm, I'm being perfectly clear. Saving them for the end. <laughs> okay.
So the, uh, pre, the since the transducer can take a reducing, oops, sorry, takes a reducing function and returns another reducing function, we can compose transducer. So we can take the output of one transducer and pass it as the input to another transducer and to get a new transducer. Right, so we can build a sequence of these things, compose them together, and get a new transducer, which we can then uh, uh, use to create a reducing function to pass to reduce. And that allows us to compose reducing functions, as we will see just in a second. So let's go through an example here. So we have a filter transducer. I'm, I'm using color coding here to sort of make keep the uh, make it clear who comes from where because this can get very confusing with higher level functions. So filter transducer takes a reducing function and returns a new reducing function where the builder is replaced by this the reducing function of the past in there. Similarly, the map transducer takes a reducing function and returns another reducing function, which uses this as the builder, right? Now I can take this map transducer and apply it to function conj, where conjoin is one reducing function. And when you do this uh, application, we basically replace the RF2 here with conj and we get this reducing function, which is the, as we know, is the map reducing function, right? So this is step number one. We take this uh, map transducer, apply it to this reducing function and get a new reducing function, which we can then pass to reduce. Now, this is just a repeat of the filter transducer we had before. And this is the map transducer that we applied to conj. So we have this conj built in here, uh, right? Now we can compose the filter transducer with this guy here. So this is the output of the map transducer which we can pass to the filter transducer. So this is what we are doing here. We take this filter transducer in red and which we apply to the my map transducer uh, with conj in it in blue, right? So that basically replaces RF1 here with this reducing function. That's the, this is step here. And so this reducing function is taking is being applied to these two guys here, RAS1 and LM1. So we can now replace these two in this step with the RAS1 and LM1, which are passed here. So this is what we get as the final reducing function. So we take map, transducer, apply to conj, pass that as input to the filter transducer, and the net result is this guy here, this reducing function. And what is this doing is it takes tests if the if the element is odd. If it is, then it increments it and adds it to the result. Otherwise, it returns the result as is. So this is essentially combining what map was doing with what filter was doing. So the composition of transducers allows us to actually compose the reducing functions inside them in this way. Yeah. Right, and that is the key, uh, that is the important uh, idea that transducers allow us to do is to actually re uh, compose reducing functions, not just the transducers. So this is uh, what we did here. We take the filter transducer composed with the map transducer applied to conj. So this first applies the filter, then applies the map transducer, and then applies the builder. So that is kind of, it works in this order. Now the compose actually works in the opposite way, right? So the compose, if I say compose of F and G, it applies G first and then F to the result. But when we do uh, compose the transducers, the reducing functions are applied in the opposite order. They are, they are applied in this order. The, the, the reducing function transducer applies, transducer one applied first, transducer is applied second, which is uh, kind of, it seems counterintuitive at first, but once you go through the way the composition works, it makes sense. So I think this is something which I just want to make sure that is clear that we are, sorry, 
we are uh, applying the transducers in this order filter transducer is uh, applied to the result of map transducer but what is happening here is the filter reducing function is applied first and the map reducing function comes second so that really is the uh, uh, important thing so essentially what we had before was uh, uh, with the thread first macro which looked like this, we can now write it in this way, the compose, take the filter transducer, map transducer, and take 10 transducer, applies that to conch, and then apply the whole thing to sequence. And that's the, we get the same result, but now we don't have the intermediate sequences anymore. Right? So the, the intermediate sequences were there because each of these was separate, working independently of each other. So they were, this was generating its sequence, this was taking that as input and producing a new sequence and so on. But when we are composing the transducers, so we are getting a single reducing function, which is basically come doing all of those things in one step. So we don't need intermediate sequences. We have, we have eliminated the intermediate sequences uh, using this uh, transducer composition. So that, that comes out of it for free. So the if you look at the documentation for the sequence functions like map and filter and so on, uh, you will say that it has two uh, arity versions, one which takes a sequence of the last argument and one which does not take the sequence of the last argument. Now, when I saw that, my first reaction was that if I, if I call map ink without the sequence, it will be a partial function, which basically can then be applied to sequence and it will do what map ink does. But that's not the case. What map ink returns instead is the map transducer. And similarly for all of the other sequence functions, they all take sequence as the last argument, but if you omit the sequence, then what you get is the corresponding transducer, which may, which is really cool because now we don't need to do anything. We just, we need a transducer. We just do this. So instead of saying this, we can now write this, right? So we just compose filter or this gives me the filter transducer. Mapping is the map transducer. Take 10 is the take transducer. And uh, these are then combined together and applied to college. And that's all uh, we need to do uh, in order to compose these things. So each of the sequence functions can return a corresponding transducer if we call it without the sequence argument. That's really cool. So there are a number of functions which take uh, transducers as parameters in, in closure. So there is the transduce function, which is like reduce, but slightly different. Uh, there is a function called eruption, uh, which we'll go through that in a minute. Sequence takes a transducer and applies to a collection. Sequence basically, if, if you don't give the transducer, then it just gives a sequence uh, uh, for this collection. But if you give a transducer, then it will apply a transducer to the collection. Uh, into is again, same thing. Into is used to, it's, it's stuff elements from this collection into this collection. And these two can be different types. So it's often used to convert from one type of sequence to another. Yeah. But we can also insert transducer in between, in which case it will apply the transducer to each of these elements before inserting it here. Similarly, channel uh, can take a transducer and then it will apply the transducer to all the elements which are put into the channel. So let's look at a little, little bit more detail. Transduce is like reduce, except it takes a transform uh, the transducer rather than a reducing uh, function as reduced it. And it also takes the final reducing function. It applies the transform, uh, this transducer to the reducing function, and then uses that as the reducing function uh, to go through the sequence. So it is similar to reduce, but there are some important differences. One thing is it works with transducers directly. So they, for reduce, we needed to compose it like this. And transduce, we don't need to do that. 
Uh, the other thing is that we can omit the init element, and in which case it calls the re this reducing function with no arguments, and each reducing function needs to implement a no argument version, which returns the uh, the initial uh, value if nothing is supplied. Right. So if there are no, no more, all reducing functions which come in closure are uh, have a no argument version which returns the basically the initial starting value if nothing is supplied here. Now the other thing is that transduce is an eager function. It actually consumes the entire sequence when you call it. On the other hand, we have a function called eduction, which is similar to transform, but there's a few differences there. And I don't know why they, they made this so different, but this is basically it takes a sequence of transducers, so it will compose them together. And so you don't need to apply compose explicitly, it will compose them and it takes a sequence. So it it will compose, it uses conj as the builder. So the builder for reduction is always conj. And it is lazy. So when you call this function, it does nothing. But when you start consuming the elements of the sequence, only then the, the transformations are applied. Otherwise, it just it builds a data structure which says this is what needs to do. So it only consumes as many values as needed, uh, except, of course, in closure, uh, lazy sequences are created in chunks of 32 elements as a kind of an optimization. But so it will consume first 32 elements, even if you want only two. But that's kind of uh, how closure works. And it's the initial value that you pass it is the empty list for this uh, for reduction. So the difference between transduce and reduction is if I uh, listed in this call here. So if the, if I call transduce on some sequence with some bunch of transformations, and then I take 10 elements from the sequence, transduce will consume all and the entire sequence before passing it to take, and then take will only take 10 of them. Induction on the other hand will only consume as many as are needed. So that's one difference between them. And there are different scenarios where you would want to use one versus the other, depending upon the performance requirements. But uh, that, that's something to keep in mind. Into is another uh, function which takes, which can take an optional argument uh, transducer. And it will take uh, apply this transducer to this uh, to the elements of the from sequence and push it into the two sequence, the transformed elements. So this is a if you don't apply uh, supply this argument, then it will basically push these elements here. But if you supply this, then these elements will be transformed. Finally, channels. The channels are essentially a concurrency mechanism. Uh, in closure, uh, which is similar to uh, the model used at Go, and it's uh, based on the uh, communicating sequential processing uh, abstraction that was first uh, defined by Hoare. So the processes communicate with each other by writing to and reading from a channel. But when we create a channel in closure, we can simply say channel and we can optionally supply a buffer. Uh, which will be used as the buffer for that channel. And the, the the two functions, two core functions on the channel, you have one is to put an element in there and one is to read an element from there. And but it optionally we can put a transducer in between. So when every data element which is put into the channel will be transformed by this before being read uh, by the uh, read operation. So this is an automatic transformation which happens here, right? So again, we the, the the important thing here is that in all of these cases we have the, using the same transducer. There's no difference in the transducer. It's just which function we use it in, and that is what controls what the input is produced and how it will be consumed. And so and it, as you can see, the transducers now work with both pull based. Mechanisms like transduce reduction, which pull data and push it to the transducers, 
and push based models where the like the chain where the uh, data is pushed into the channel and it works for both eager and lazy evaluations they don't really care so the, the transducers have no knowledge about the context in which they are being called whatever context they are being called they will still work the same way and we can create other functions that we, we use transducers to do other things so if you want to uh, build our own library, we can do that. And we don't need to actually replicate these sites for each one. We can simply take the same transducers and use them in other functions which read from some different type of input or build some other type of output as we need. So we can basically also create a generic reduced function. which takes a transducer, a builder, and a producer. And essentially, uh, in, this is a very generic kind of thing where basically the producer will produce the input elements and builder will produce the output sequence. So it could be writing it to a database or to a queue or build, putting it in a sequence, whatever you want it to do. And this is basically a very generic way of doing things. And now the transform the transducers are still the same. We don't need to do, redo the transducers. Now, of course, the init is something which depends upon what the builder is, uh, right? So the if we are writing to a queue, then the init would be the queue connection parameter. If it's a database, it would be database connection. If it's a uh, vector, then it would be initially probably the empty vector and so on. So the init and builder are related to each other, but the idea is that now we can do basically any input to any output with, with the same transformation. So any, does that make sense so far? Yeah, I think one of the highlights I'm taking out of this is just like the killer feature of being able to do this on async streams. So you mentioned the go blocks, Right. the channels that's amazing coming from a enterprise.net world it's pretty difficult dealing with async so that's really nice the, the, the async stuff was the motivation when they started doing channels and they said okay well we need to build all these functions again and that's why yeah. they, they said no let's do it in a more generic manner so we don't need to do all this again and this sounds very yeah elegant Im the implementation is just beautiful right <clears throat> It was a, it's a brilliant idea. I think it's really yeah key. Now, in most of the cases, you don't really need to build transducers because, as I said, all sequence functions uh, can return corresponding transducer. Uh, but if if you really have to uh, define your own transducers. Then there are some additional uh, things which need to be taken into account, right? So there are some complications which I have skipped so far, uh, which we need to worry about. So one thing is that when we create a reducing function, it we need to create three versions of this: one with the zero arity, one with the arity one, and one with the arity two. So the arity two is a normal reducing function which takes the Results so far and the next element and does its thing. But the arity zero is there. It's called if you want to produce the init initial uh, value of the results, which typically the function will return the identity of their operation. So there with plus as a reducing function, if you call plus with nothing, it will return zero. Star, if you call it with no arguments, it will return one and so on. So all of the reducing functions uh, built in closer will return something sensible if you call it with no arguments. Similarly, the arity one clean is called if we need to do any cleanup at the end of input. So when the, all the input is complete, uh, then the reduce uh, or all of the these functions, reduce like functions, will call the redu reducing function with single one argument. And the point here is that you want to give the reducing function a chance to do any cleanup at the end. So if it's maintaining some state or needs to do some special processing at the end, then the identity one function uh, allows you to do that. 
And then the LED2 is, of course, the normal reducing function. So the, the thing to remember that if you want to create a reducing function, then you have to provide all three LEDs. So here's the source code for map, well, actually partial source code. This is the transducer part of the map function. So if I call map with just the function, but without the sequence, then this is what happens. It returns a new function, which takes a reducing function. It, remember, it, if I call it with just the function, it returns a transducer. So the transducer is a function which takes a reducing function, right? And then returns another function. So this returns a function with three arities. Zero arity, it just calls the reducing function with no initial value, uh, with no argument, so that the, it, it relies on this to produce, produce the output, uh, in, uh, the uh, initial output. Sorry, I'm sorry. This keeps skipping. Yeah. If I call it with just single element, the result, then it calls the input uh, reducing function with that result. So basically, if this reducing function, which was the builder function, needs to do some finalization, it can do that. And otherwise, it does the standard behavior. So it applies the reducing function to the result and the F applied to the input. So this is uh, if you look at the source code for map, and then able, this is the half of the source code, the other half is the sequence processing. And similarly for the other uh, functions as well, each of them returns, each of these functions returns the transducer, which looks like this, though it's some, in some cases it's more complicated. And the other thing we need to keep in mind is that if we want to stop the processing before all the input is consumed, uh, then there is a special protocol. So we return a wrapped object uh, called reduced of X. So when a reducer returns the reduced X, then the reduced function knows that, okay, I need to stop consuming more input. And it will stop at that point. And so there is a predicate reduced uh, X, which uh, tests if the value is wrapped and reduced. So each uh, uh, time it calls the reducing function, reduce will check if the returned value is reduced. And if it is reduced, then it can, uh, then it will stop processing and it will ret retrieve the inside value here using DREF. So it's a standard DREF you can use to get the, uh, the, uh, the wrapped value. So that's the other thing we need to keep in mind that if you want to stop premature, like take 10, for example, we'll stop after 10 elements. So uh, at the end of the 10th element, it will return reduced X rather than the result. Okay, so that's, those are the things which we need to keep in mind if you are creating your own reducers or own reducing functions. So I hope uh, that uh, was helpful and get, gives, gives you a better understanding of what transducers are and why they exist and how we can use them. Uh, if you need more details, there's a lot of references, but I think the, one of the best um, references I can give you is the you know, talk by Rich Hickey, uh, who did uh, a presentation in uh, Strange Loop. And that's a very good introduction to what transducers are. And there are also come a couple of other blog entries uh, by Ben Slash and Eero Helenius. Uh, which are also uh, give another explanations uh, for these things. So I, uh, I mean, none of my material here is original. I have basically gone through a number of different articles and so on, understood them and tried to simplify and make give a more step-by-step -step presentation. So I hope that was of use. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I'll be a little honest here and say that I've avoided them for a little while because of the just thinking it was only for eager um, evaluation on like a stream of input. So I preferred having lazy methods being on like AWS cloud. So just knowing now that you can do async calls through that and doing transformations on that just opened my mind up. So I'm eager to start trying to implement them in different ways. Thank you. Any questions or any other comments? 
I think, I don't know if this might be a hurdle for people, but the concept of a higher order function coming from an object oriented language is a different kind of, different kind of cat. So um, I guess if anybody had any ideas on like how to break that down, I know use them in like ring handlers and stuff like that, but um, I'm just wondering if that's a roadblock for people getting into transducers. Honestly, or, I think that what started really making higher order functions click for me was basic ones like using map and so on. But I'd say the second like layer of understanding was actually seeing partial functions when I was looking at Haskell where everything's curried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the curry application is a great, great uh, primer on that. I used Professor Frisbee's on uh, the whole JS library stuff. That was pretty interesting. It would be interesting, yeah. perhaps, because like a lot of this stuff is very similar. Mm. Uh, sorry, a lot of the stuff. I'm very precise with that. Um, what I think could be an interesting way to like have people learn it is if you were to try and like migrate a specific reasonably complex example from uh, just like a thread last macro over to a transducer. Oh yeah. Because like a lot of people, please no offense to the speaker, are trying to like explain the theory behind it and that's really good to learn. But if all people talks about are the theories and toy examples, it doesn't feel as grounded. I'm sorry, that probably sounds presumptuous. No, I think for my example, it's fitting because until I started thinking about it in a way of just handling async streams and doing transformations on those on the fly, it's a super powerful idea, but I was discrediting it for a while because I only thought it was not lazy. So. <laughs> I was afraid of blowing my stack or something if I overuse transducers or something like that. Right, so the transducers themselves are completely agnostic as to whether it's lazy or eager. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, so do you um, find yourself reaching for the transducers and just building it as a transducer now instead of just thread last, you know, all my code is threads every thread last everywhere. But yeah, do you same. reach for the transducers more now, just just in case you want to be able to apply them to other to streams and stuff? Or, right, or so you, I mean, the other, other problem with thread last is all the intermediate sequences too, right? So yeah. Mm -hmm. so if you have large sequences, then you're creating a lot of garbage. Well, and I think related, I'm not sure if it's a question, but uh, thread last is a macro. This is all functions. And I'm still trying to understand practical implications of that. So maybe my question is, does anyone have any thoughts? Does it matter? I don't know. I mean, from a fun functional standpoint, it should be, but I don't understand the async 100% to say like applying that on an async string that that would have the same consequences or not, but you should be able to create a macro around everything, right? And it just does it before compilation, as long as there's no state that you need to carry along. So like on a channel, you cannot use thread last macro, right? Oh, okay, yes, exactly, yeah. So if you have a state, then you can't. Yeah, yeah that, right. that explains it, yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. Would you happen to know about applications of this to uh, distributed computing, right? So, for example, I'm thinking of Spark. Uh, have people made heavy use of it, or do, how, what What changes do you need to make in order for these transducers to work? All right, so that's the other beauty of it, means so the transducers themselves, I mean, as long as the, re the reducing function is pure function, yeah, uh, you can use it like the PMAP, for example, can be used uh, implemented using transducers just as easily, right? The only constraint there is that if you are building the output as a sequence, uh, then that doesn't work, right? Because right. Uh, each each parallel stream is building its own output. Yeah. But if you are outputting it to a stream or a database or something, then that's perfectly reasonable thing to do. Okay, I see what you're saying. 
somebody just shared a good link in the chat for the Zoom about a comparison of threaded macros and transducers to I think one of the things I quite like about uh, using transducers is that it's not threaded macros. I think so often threaded macros are a, uh, it's, it's used as a way to think in a sequential form that is easier if you have recently come from uh, another style of programming. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. There are some situations where threaded macros are a really good tool but used as a crutch, uh, it's, it's not good. It's not good at all. It's much better to take the step into the Lisp way of thinking where you're starting in the middle and working out rather than starting at the top and working down. Right. Um, and I wonder just what for that comparisons reason. you can do to like consoles, car cutter and that, if there's a way to like show a representation of, Hey, from a Lisp standpoint, this is how we would handle this type of situation instead of defaulting to a threaded macro. Hmm. My own personal guideline has been if I'm dealing with like a scalar value, like if I have a number of things, so that means eventually I am inside some other some other sequence processing usually. But if say there's oh here's a couple of validity checks I need to go through, but I'm only handed one thing and not trying to approve a whole sequence. I'd say perhaps that would be another way of trying to break down the difference that uh, stacking things up the way that a threaded macro makes easy works for singular things and that's what it's meant for. But if you want to use sequences, you should probably start thinking of reaching for transducers. No, that's a good thing. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, so my aunt, we uh, had some people admiring your slide set. Uh, did those slides be uh, shareable at some point? Uh, yeah, sure. I will send it out. Uh, uh, should I post your meetup or uh, how do you want it to be shared? Yeah, if you give me the link, I'll post it on meetup and uh, various other forums where we announce uh, the availability of the video and uh, announce new okay. meetups and so yeah, on. Yeah, I'll do that. Terrific. Yeah, I really uh, lo love this approach. You know, you start from basic uh, concepts and kind of build up the idea of transducers, their utility and uh, sort of inner workings. And, uh, and then from there, look at how closures, transducer functions um, implement those concepts. So uh, I, I think transducers is one of the parts of, of closure that's underutilized. Uh, mm -hmm. people, people do have this, this hurdle. It's, it's um, a little bit more complex. And uh, so it's really great to have these kinds of informational sessions where people can see uh, the, the power and generality of, of transducers and closure and uh, hopefully whet their appetite to try some uh, examples out for themselves. And, and that really is important to, to get your hands on, uh, actually write some code uh, before you can get comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. So I encourage everyone to do that. Any other questions or observations for Maya? Uh, just that was a really nice, clear explanation and very um, well presented. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes, likewise. Really thank good. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Also, my apologies for the um, botched pronunciation earlier.